Hello and welcome to my next video on cells and this is chemistry not biological cells. So the first thing you need to know about is redox. Now you should remember this from AS but I'll quickly go over it. Redox is when you have oxidation reduction occurring at the same time. Oxygen is a loss of electrons. Reduction is a gain of electrons. And the best way, just I'm going to go through an example, on page 183 of the A2 textbook, question 1a and b. Um, question 1a says construct redox equations from the following half equations. Half equation is when you've got either oxidation or reduction happening. So we have aluminium becomes aluminium 3 plus plus 3 minus. That is an oxidation because it is losing electrons. Copper 2 plus plus 2e minus becomes copper. That is reduction. It is gaining electrons. So we've got an oxidation, we've got a reduction, we're going to join them together. Now, you have to make sure that things balance, particularly the charges. Now, if you're going to add these two equations, the thing that you need to make sure you can add is the electrons, so the electrons will cancel out. And to do this, you find the lowest common factor. 3 and 2, well, they both go into 6, that is their lowest common factor. So you times 3 by 2, so aluminium, you times the whole equation by 2, so you'll have 2Al becomes 2Al3 plus plus 6E minus, and you times the copper equation by 3. So 3Cu2 plus plus 6E minus becomes Cu, and then you just add them together. So the overall equation is 2Al plus 3Cu2 plus becomes 2Al3 plus plus 3Cu. The charges balance, on one side you have 6 pluses, on the other side you have 6 pluses, um, on one, you have two aluminiums on both sides, three coppers on both sides, so that balances, and that is a redox. Question um, 1b is very similar. You have 2Br- becomes Br2 plus 2E-, minus. that again is an oxidation. And then a famous um, reduction is MnO4- minus plus 8H+, plus, plus 5E- minus becomes Mn2+, plus, plus 4H2O. So rule, if you have to construct these, if you have water on one side, if you have extra hydrogens, which you shouldn't really be having, you can just add H+. Equally, if you have extra hydrogens and oxygens, you can add OH- to make them balance, and then balance the charges accordingly. So, first thing you want to do is you want to balance the MNs we have. Then we've got 4H2O, so 4H2, so 8H+, then balance the charges using the electrons. So, we have five electrons in the MnO4- minus equation, Two electrons in the Br minus. Lowest common factor is 10. So times the first equation by 5, second equation by 2. And you get the bottom equation. I'm not going to read out. It's very long and you can read for yourselves, I'm sure. But I, that should be fresh from AS. So, what is an electrochemical cell? In redox reactions, electrons are transferred. An electrochemical cell controls the electron transfer to produce electrical energy. So this is what we can use for like batteries. So we have cells and half cells. A half cell is when you have just either the oxidation or reduction happening. And the full cell is when you have the a full redox equation going on, because that way you're having electrons moving about. And by convention, we write now these are always equilibriums, because you never have, you know, let's say um, here, Cu2 plus plus 2e minus going to copper. Exactly. It's always a mixture of both. But we write it as it is as if the element is being um, reduced. So we write the electrons on the left-hand side. So it's be Cu2 plus plus 2e minus equilibrium sign becomes copper. So this is a metal and the metal ion half cells added together. So the red line you can see I've circled is a copper half cell, but the whole thing is a full cell. And things to remember: you have a beaker where you have solutions which contain the ions and a metal electrode which contains the metal version of the ion or well the not ion it's actually just an element here isn't it so we have zinc metal and a solution of zinc ions copper metal and a solution of copper ions and looking at this i've probably drawn it the wrong way around it should be the other way but it doesn't matter we'll see we'll see why it's important later now these are connected to a voltmeter where you can read the voltage and the two solutions must be connected by a salt bridge to allow, kind of, basically complete the cell and allow electrons to move over. And this salt bridge contains um, aqueous potassium nitrate. Now, some things, the basically standard conditions, 298 Kelvin, one atmosphere, and the solutions must be one mole per dm cubed. 
Now in this version, sync will release electrons, which will go along our wire, so along the electrode, along the wire, um, which will make zinc the negative electrode. The electrons flow along the wire to the copper electrode, and this will make copper the positive electrode. Now, so in this case, zinc will lose electrons, so it will be oxidized, and you'll get more zinc, aqueous zinc forming than zinc. Copper will gain the electrons, so it will be reduced. And so you'll get more copper forming out of the aqueous solution. And reading on the voltmeter is the potential difference, or the EMF. So you can look at some other types of half cells now. We have a hydrogen uh, fuel cell, or half cell. Uh, now this is when a non-metal with its non-metal ion. So hydrogen's a non-metal. And then we're the Fe2+, and the Fe3+, which is when you have a metal ion with another metal ion. So we'll look at both. Firstly, the hydrogen. Now, hydrogen's a gas, so you can't have a, you can't have, you know, well, you can't have a solid hydrogen metal electrode, because it's not a metal, it's found as a gas. But you can have a, a, an acidic solution to produce H plus ions, and you have hydrogen gas go in. Now, the H plus ions, the acidic solution, is one mole per dm cubed. The H2 gas goes in, and you have a platinum electrode. The platinum electrode is inert, so it doesn't actually react. Now the platinum will um, basically, now the metal ion with another metal ion, we have Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, again there's no solid there, there's no solid iron, they're both ions, they're iron ions, and what you do here is you again have a platinum electrode, which is in a solution where you have an equal concentration of Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus ions, so you can have one mole per dm cubed of each. Just so that, well, they, so they can balance and then they can transfer electrons, which will be taken by the platinum electrode. So, cell potentials. You have an electrode potential, that's for a half cell. The standard electrode potential of a half cell is the EMF, the electromotive force of a half cell compared with a standard hydrogen half cell measured at 298 Kelvin with solution concentrations of mole, one mole per dm cubed and a gas pressure of one atmosphere. So basically, it's standard conditions, and it's measured against the hydrogen half cells. The hydrogen half cell is zero. We say that it's got a standard electro potential of zero. Everything else is measured against it. Now, we also have a standard cell potential. And this is the standard cell potential, which is the um, difference between the standard electro potentials of each of the half cells. So the way we do this is we literally we have a positive terminal and a negative terminal. Now the positive terminal is the one which is more positive. So you could have um, plus 0 0.74 and plus 0 0.44. So they're both positive, but one is more positive than the other. So the one that's more positive is the positive one. The one that is not as positive is negative. And the equation is positive minus negative. So you basically want the difference between them. So in this case, if one half cell was 0 0.74 and the other was minus 0 0.22 measured in volts, you do 0 0.74 minus minus 0 0.22, so add them, essentially, which gives you 0 0.96 volts. And that is the standard cell potential of this, you know, cell. There are a few more examples on page 187, but it's literally just that equation. And we'll look at more important things to do with it in the next slide. That's feasibility of reactions. Now, we can use these, equa these equations to predict redox reactions, which way are they going to go. Because, I mean, why, in I've written here copper and um, iron. Why in this case is the copper ion going to be reduced to copper and why is the iron going to be oxidised Fe2+, plus? why not the other way around? Well, we do something called the anti-clockwise rule. Basically, put the positive terminal equation on top of the negative terminal equation. So copper is plus 0 0.34, iron is minus 0 0.44, so you can see positive negative. Now, then what you do is you just go anti-clockwise. So, start at the bottom one, iron. Anti-clockwise means it goes iron 2 Fe2+, plus, then go up and continue going anti-clockwise. The co Cu2+, plus goes to copper. So, that's how you look at it. Just do the anti-clockwise rule. So, you start at the uh, bottom one, which is more negative, and go anti-clockwise. That's the way the reaction is going to occur. Now, if a reaction is feasible, the 
electro the standard uh, cell potential will be bigger than 0 0.4 volts. If it is less than 0 0.4 volts, it is unlikely it will take place. It could, but it's unlikely. So for this reaction, we've got 0 0.34 minus negative 0 0.44 equals 0 0.78 volts, so it is likely to happen. Now, one thing you need to know about limitations of using the predictions. Now, non-standard conditions will alter the value. But also, a change in electrode potential resulting from concentration changes means that the predictions made on the basis of the standard cell may not be valid. So if you increase or decrease the concentration of one, knowing Le Chatelier's principle, you could get a change in the reading of the value. Also, there might be an extremely high activation energy, so the reaction may be slow, so that's why you might not get the reading. Or the actual conditions used for a reaction may be different from the standard conditions. And standard electro potentials also apply to aqueous equilibria. Many reactions take place under very different conditions. So just there are some limitations to it. So we're now going to look at cells and their uses. So we've looked at electrochemical cells. Now there are three types of electrochemical cell, which we use as modern day cells and batteries. Non-rechargeable cells, rechargeable cells and fuel cells. So firstly, non-rechargeable cells provide electrical energy until the chemicals have reacted to such an extent that the voltage fails. The cell is then flat and is discarded. Rechargeable cells, the chemicals in the cell react providing electrical energy. The cell reaction can be reversed during recharging. The chemicals in the cell are regenerated and the cell can be used again. Common examples are the nickel and cadmium batteries used in rechargeable batteries and lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries used in laptops. And finally, fuel cells. Fuel cells, the cell reaction uses external supplies of a fuel and an oxidant, which are consumed and need to be provided continuously. The cell will continue to provide electrical energy as long as there is a supply of a fuel and an oxidant, for example, perhaps petrol. So, methanol. The equation of methanol plus water produces hydrogen and carbon dioxide. You need to know that because it is a source of hydrogen, and I'll go on to explain a little bit later, but it can also be used as a fuel. But we're going to firstly look at the more important one, the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. And this is basically is a fuel cell used to energy from the reaction of a fuel with oxygen voltage. Basically, uh, the reactants flow in, the products flow out while the electrolyte remains in the cell. Fuel cells can be operated virtually continuously so long as the fuel and oxygen continue to flow into the cell. Fuel cells do not have to be recharged. Now there's an alkaline electrolyte in the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell and you have two equations. I've written them out in the correct orders we're going to be using them. We have hydrogen plus 2OH minus becomes 2H2O plus 2E minus. My, and that has a, volt, a, half, um, a, a half cell potential, electro potential of minus 0 0.83 volts. And the next one, Half oxygen plus 2H2O become, plus 2E minus becomes 2OH minus plus 0 0.4 volts. Now, this is the way you're going to you add them like that. And if you look in the book, you can see how the anti clockwise rule applies to it. But, yeah, so if you look at the anti clockwise rule, so I've drawn it, I've drawn it the correct way around, so I haven't done that well. But if you look at the book, you can see that it, how the anti clockwise rule will work. Now, add them. You can see electrons on both sides will be cancelled out. 2H2O will be cancelled out. 2OH minus is cancelled. So all that's left is hydrogen plus oxygen. A half oxygen, rather. And that produces water, as we know. So hydrogen plus half O2 just produces water. And then... So that means what you do is you put hydrogen in. You put um, oxygen in. Make sure there is a continuous supply of water and OH minus ions, as in the electrolyte, so alkaline in other words. And if you add them together, all you get out is water, so very clean. And this will produce a voltage of 1.23 volts. Now, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Re read that in the book, you'll just see how the anti-clockwise rule works there, but you just need to know those two equations. Hydrogen plus OH minus becomes water plus electrons. Half O2 plus water plus electrons becomes 2OH minus. Add them together to get Hydrogen plus oxygen becomes water. Now, why methanol is good? Because it produces hydrogen. So we can then use the hydrogen in the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. But equally, we can use methanol as a fuel itself. Because you can combust it. Because a liquid fuel is easier to store than hydrogen gas. And methanol can be generated from biomass. 
Now, they are early days of development, and they only generate a small amount of power, and also CO2 is produced, so there's benefits and disadvantages to both. We're now just going to go very quickly through the kind of... There's always a green bit of chemistry thrown into these sort of chapters, so I'm going to go through them. Advantages of uh, fuel cells. Less pollution and less CO2. Combustion of hydrocarbon fuels produces CO2, which uh, contributes to the greenhouse effect, and incomplete combustion produces carbon monoxide. Hydrogen-rich fuel cells produce only small amounts of CO2 and air pollutants. I mean, the hydrogen oxygen one produces no CO2. It just produces those two chemicals, the water, and it produces water. The greater efficiency. Petrol engine is less than 20% efficient. Hydrogen fuel cells are 40 to 60% efficient. So that's good. This means that fuel consumption drops by more than half compared with petrol or diesel. But how do we store hydrogen? There are three main ways, because it's difficult to store gases than it is to store liquids. Now, you can store hydrogen as a liquid under pressure. Now, this itself creates problems because even under pressure, a very low temperature is required and liquid hydrogen will need to be stored in a giant thermo flask to prevent it from boiling, but it, it can be done. You can add it onto the surface of a solid material in a similar way that a catalyst is able to hold gases on its surface. So basically, it'll just hold hydrogen. But you can also absorb it with some solid material. So that will be kind of the, be in between the uh, lattice of the solid. But we also have limitations. The large scale storage and transport of hydrogen poses problems. A cost effective and efficient energy efficient infrastructure needs to be in place to deliver large quantities of hydrogen fuel over long distances. The feasibility of storing a pressurized liquid, it's quite hard to store a pressurized liquid. Current adsorbers and absorbers of hydrogen have a limited lifetime, and current fuel cells have a limited lifetime, requiring regular replacement and disposal and fuel cells use toxic chemicals in their production. And there is this thing called the hydrogen economy, which is basically, you know, is hydrogen good for, well, is using hydrogen fuel efficient and, you know, energy efficient and good for the environment. Now, the use of hydrogen as a fuel has to be accepted politically and by the general public. There are logistical problems in handling and maintenance of hydrogen systems. It is quite hard. But also hydrogen is an en energy carrier, not an energy source. Hydrogen must first be manufactured either by electrolysis of water or by reacting methane with steam. The danger is that more energy may be used in making the hydrogen than is saved by its use. One strategy is to use renewable e forms of energy such as the wind or solar power to generate hydrogen. So basically, hydrogen isn't, won't give you fuel. It isn't giving you fuel it is transferring energy because you need to be able to create hydrogen some way hydrogen isn't just naturally i know i know it's the most abundant uh, element in the universe but it's not just naturally around us we can't just pluck it out and use it we can't you know get a you know a cup and just put it into your car straight away you have to produce it and then store it and that uses energy as well and that's that in conclusion you need to know about fuel cells half cells and electrochemical cells and how to do calculations with them and feasibility I hope that makes sense. It's uh, a little bit confusing at times. But if you essentially just remember the anti-clockwise rule and know how to do redox equations, you'll be fine. Any questions, um, please ask me. Either email me or comment. Um, if you have any suggestions for how these videos are being done, as always, please comment. Um, and thank you for watching, and goodbye.